Thank you, President Furman and President Mirror, uh, members of the and representatives of the founding families, Treacher's College trustees and alumni, and distinguished guests. Uh, we are gathered this evening, obviously, to mark 125 years of achievement and service, to celebrate the leadership and accomplishment of so many scholars and graduates, and to set the stage for another century in which Teachers College will once again set the standard for American education. It would be appropriate tonight to recount the many reasons you all have to be so proud. The legacy of firsts can be, they can be traced to 120th Street. Among them, nursing education, educational psychology, special education, education for the gifted, and urban education. Not to mention the yellow school bus and the most famous song in our culture, Happy Birthday to You. Or I might give biographical sketches of the titans of Teachers College, people like Edward Lee Thorndike, John Dewey, Nicholas Murray Butler, Larry Kremen, Maxine Green, Harry Passow, among others. Special attention, as Susan noted, would have to go to Grace Dodge, the founder of Teachers College. Yes, she was rich. Yes, she was well-born. But so were a lot of other people. And precious few of them ever had such an enduring impact upon this country. From the YWCA to the Traveler's Aid Society to the effort to protect vulnerable young women from prostitution, what was then called white slavery, to Teachers College itself, Grace Dodge seemed to be everywhere at the same time, not just with her money, but with her time, her dedication, her leadership, her passion. As Larry Kremen, David Shannon, and Mary Evelyn Townsend wrote in their History of Teachers College, it was the emphasis which Grace Dodge laid upon manual and practical education, professional training, and the study of education. She saw them all as means to better homes, better children, better communities, better morals. In a word, to a better world. The second person I have to mention is James Earl Russell. His was the decisive influence that made Teachers College the place in the United States to think about education and how to make it most effective. Russell was the person who created the program of professional education that would later be copied first by dozens and then hundreds of similar institutions across the land. But I am not going to recount the history of Teachers College. The extensive exhibition on the wall just out the door, which I urge you to examine closely during the reception which follows this program, does that more impressively than I can do in a few minutes. And those of you who want a more extensive and complete review of the many accomplishments of Teachers College would want to consult one of the several studies of the institution and most especially that of the greatest historian of American education, Lawrence A. Kremen, published in 1954. And by the way, they have also a video um, of some of the leaders of Teachers College, including a quite wonderful about President and Professor Kremen himself. Rather, my charge tonight is to put the founding generation of Teachers College into its larger context. What was the world of Grace Dodge like when she came to maturity and began her life of service and accomplishment? My point, as you no doubt realize, is that New York was not just any city or any place. Let us remind ourselves a couple of things. First, the city was already 250 years old when Grace Dodge 
grew to voting age if she could have voted at the time, which she couldn't. Um, it was older than Boston or Philadelphia, older than Newport or Williamsburg, or Savannah or Charleston. Older, in fact, than any city in the United States. Of course, I'm dismissing Jamestown in Virginia and Plymouth in Massachusetts, both of which quite literally disappeared into the earth. Nor should we give much time to St. Augustine in Florida or Santa Fe in New Mexico. They're technically old, but they were really only wide places in the road for more than 300 years or until well into the 20th century. So the home of Teachers College is the oldest city in the United States. So what? New Yorkers never much cared about the oldest anything. Um, so let's, uh, let me admit that in the colonial period, let us say from 1630 to 1740, Boston was the great city of the colonies. And then at mid 18th century was surpassed, not by New York, but by Philadelphia. William Penn's green country town, which with its grid pattern and wonderful squares, seemed to be the future great city of America. It was the city of brother love, brotherly love, and its primacy lasted until about 1800. After that, it was all New York. By the time of the Civil War, New York was roughly, roughly twice the size of its nearest rival, which then would have been Chicago. I mean, then would have been Philadelphia. By 1890, 1900, it was Chicago. By about 1960, it was Los Angeles, but always roughly the same size difference between the great metropolis and whatever was in second place. It took a bit longer for New York to become the cultural capital of the United States. Certainly at the time of the Civil War, even though this was the great city, both Boston and Philadelphia saw themselves as more sophisticated, more intellectual, more cultured, more elegant than New York. After all, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, James Russell Lowell. By the way, when I was studying American literature in high school, I thought you had to have three names and be from... Um, <laughs> Be from, the, be from the Boston area to be important. It's interesting, by the way, that the three great writers now from that period are considered Walt Whitman, Edgar Allan Poe, and Herman Melville. And notice they were all in New York, but they didn't think that when I was in school. What happened to make New York a cultural capital as well as the financial, media, business, every other kind of capital of the country? Some observers date it to 1885 when William Dean Howells, another three-letter person who was then thought to be the most cultured man in America, America's foremost man of letters, moved from Boston to New York. Actually, it was much more complicated than that and did not happen all at once. Magazines, publishers began to move toward the city. But a major factor was that the great wealth of the nation began concentrating in New York after the Civil War. Some of it was actually homegrown. The Dodge family, for example, which made its fortune in mining in the West, but really was based in New York. John Jacob Astor, whom we associate with Astoria and the fur trade, actually made his fortune by investing in New York real estate and said, he was the richest man in America when he died in 1848, and he said, just before he died, he said, if I could live life over again, knowing then what I know now, I would buy every square foot of the island of Manhattan. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, Commodore Vanderbilt, who transformed a little ferry service from Staten Island into one of the great railroad fortunes of the world. But much of the great wealth that concentrated in New York came from other places. John D. Rockefeller, for example, whose wealth has recently been estimated in our terms as $250 billion, or more than two and a half times 
as wealthy as the second richest person in American history, who would, by the way, be Andrew Carnegie. And by the way, Rockefeller could have bought and sold Downton Abbey 50 times out of <laughs> spare change. Um, moved to New York from Cleveland. Or Andrew Carnegie, creator of United States Steel Corporation, and his colleague, Henry Clay Frick, moved here to Fifth Avenue, where their mansions, of course, still stand. J.P. Morgan comes down from Boston. Frank W. Woolworth from upstate New York and many other families, but together they made New York the symbol, the capital of what we call the Gilded Age. That period, roughly early 1870s to early in the 20th century. There are enormous mansions. There are dozens of servants. There are elegant shops where they searched. There are liveried footmen. They were the symbols of the age. Why the, what we call them robber barons are important is that they also initiated the great American tradition of public-private philanthropy. Rockefeller and Carnegie, you can't talk about the history of New York and leave out Rockefeller. I mean, half the things here somehow seemed like they were hers, the his. Andrew Carnegie and his gospel of wealth who said that the man who dies rich dies disgraced, that it's, he's the trustee of the money and it's his obligation to return it with its best use to the people who actually were responsible for it. How did it happen that they transformed New York at the end of the 19th century? When Teachers College began, just think about some of the great institutions. Right across the street, the American Museum of Natural History. It's got a great statue of Teddy Roosevelt in front, but Maybe it should have been William E. Dodge, Grace Dodge's father, who was central to that creation. Or across, just across the park, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, started in 1870. In 1871, the first edition, more or less, of Grand Central Station was built. Meanwhile, Augustus Juilliard was beginning, his, even though the Juilliard School was not started until just after the century, was already funding music and music education. In 1883, the great Metropolitan Opera we associate with William Henry Vanderbilt, and then only later the person who in ways really built it, Otto Kahn. In 1883, the Brooklyn Bridge, at the time the eighth wonder of the world. After all, who could have thought that a clothesline with a, in between wouldn't have collapsed, wouldn't have fallen in? People thought that they wanted to see elephants walk around it before they would do it. Uh, anyway, it linked the first and third largest cities in the United States. It was one of the most beautiful things that had ever been built. In 1889, Barnard College. In 1891, the New York Bot Botanical Garden. We associate so much with, again, the Carnegie family, with the Vanderbilts, with the Morgans. Also, just in the same decade, the New York, the great, the grand New York Public Library. When I was doing my dissertation on the Ku Klux Klan, I remember going all over the place looking for things and then going to 42nd Street. And there it was. Why did I spend all this time running around? All this ephemera was in the New York Public Library, which represented really the coming together of the Tilden and Lennox and Astor Libraries, and this were certainly one of the great treasures. And along the way, Columbia changed from being just a little men's college to being Columbia University in the city of New York and slowly transformed into the great, one of the great centers of learning in the entire world. These were not just a list of institutions that you could recite for every American city. They were world-class institutions, which transformed this metropolis into a center of culture that could at first rival and ultimately surpass London and Paris, Berlin and Vienna, Florence and Rome. Teachers College fits squarely in this exciting period of institution building. Across America, in places like St. Louis, Cincinnati, Cleveland and Buffalo, 
concerned citizens were asking themselves about education. What is the purpose of going to school? Who should pay for it? Should we waste time and resources on females when they will likely return home after marriage? Should teachers have any official training? You know how you got a job as a teacher in New York in the 1880s or 1890s. Well, as good, a, as good an idea as any might have been to go down to the Bowery and go to the ward clubhouse of Big Tim Sullivan. Because you got a job as a teacher the same way you got a job as a policeman. It was who you know. What could you do for the organization? Not that you'd jump through a certain amount of hoops. New York had all of those issues that other American cities had but more, because New York was a different city, a different kind of city than the others I've just mentioned. How? First of all, it was big, really, really big. Already by the Civil War, but first, by 1800, it was just another place, maybe 60,000 people. By 1900, it was the second largest city in the world after London. And just in three decades, it would surpass London to be the Largest city in the world and the first metropolis ever to reach 15 million. But it was not just big. New York, in the founding era of Teachers College, was, as I said, a new kind of city. First, it was diverse. Klein Deutschland, when Grace Dodge was thinking about Teachers College, think of it as east of 3rd Avenue and south of 14th Street would have been the third largest city in the German Empire after Berlin and Hamburg. New York already had more Irish than Dublin. And a few years later, with the great shift in immigration from southern to southern and eastern Europe, New York had more Italians than Naples, more Jews than any place including Warsaw. By the time James Earl Russell was head of the city, more people were coming in from Greece and Scandinavia and Czechoslovakia and Hungary and even Asia. And next year, if I think is correct, this institution will have an important exhibition on Asian immigration, one of the first to celebrate this important movement to our country and our city. Cities, of course, are exploding around the world as we speak, in China and Africa and South America. But as large as those movements are, and they're enormous in China, mostly they're internal migrations. But never before or since have so many different people from so many different places crowded together in as small a place as New York. How crowded were these people in the early days of Teachers College? Well, a century ago, or a little more, the densities on the Lower East Side, that's the number of people in a given area, reached almost 1,000 per square mile along Rivington and Ludlow and Essex and the many famous streets of the Lower East Side. More dense than Bombay, more dense than the famous Gorbel slum in Glasgow or Prague. In fact, if all of New York City had been as dense as the Lower East Side, all of the people in the United States could easily have fit in New York City. Not just in 1900, but as late as 1950. Um, think of Manhattan, just for a second. In 1910, its population peaked at 2.3 million people and then began to decline. The last 20 years or so, it's eased back up again. But just think of that. It was 50% more populous in 1910 than in 2010. There were almost no tall residential buildings then. Almost no one lived well, a little much farther here, but after all, the subway opens in 1904. So really, Upper Manhattan is mostly empty. 
and yet 50% more people than are today. That's crowding. Or think of it another way. Think of those little apartments. If you can dignify them by such a name, many of you have been to the Lower East Side Tenement Museum on Orchard Street at 97 Orchard Street. 325 square feet. Yeah, that's just an abstract number, but if you take seven paces in one direction and seven paces in another, you pretty much have it. That's for a family. You know, husband, wife, two, three, four kids, and maybe an aunt or a niece or an uncle or a nephew, and maybe to make ends meet a boarder or two to contribute a nickel a night to the family economy. And there was no ventilation. The windows, by the way, until most, even though Dumbbell Tenement Law was passed in 1879, it was not retroactive. So if you didn't have a window, you didn't have a window. So your apartment is dark 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now you can open the window in the back room, but why would you not want to do that? Because outside, six whole outhouses. So not a lot of fresh air that way either. Um, so it's not surprising that once a week, maybe mom and dad separately would go down to the public bath and for a nickel get a towel and some soap and a few minutes alone with some water. Um, but amazingly, these immigrants in these tiny spaces were part of a remarkable success story. So by 1910, they were already leaving, just to mention the Jews. First to Williamsburg and Harlem, when Harlem was Jewish, early part of the 20th century. Then to the Grand Congress in the Bronx or Borough Park and Canarsie and Brooklyn and then on elsewhere. And then the other immigrant groups as well. So New York was a gigantic kind of manufacturer of family success. Success was often measured in moving, in change, and going somewhere else. And the schools, partly because of the leadership of Teachers College, New York went from a system of having very poor schools. And by the way, even though the laws said you had to be in school, we had an exhibition here a few years ago on newsboys. Well, the law said you couldn't, you had to be in school until you were 10 or 12. Tell that to the kids who are eight years old selling newspapers. So there's one thing is the law, the other thing is the reality. But New York City transformed itself and created a public education system that through much of the 20th century was the envy of the nation. When I came to Columbia in 1968, however, things had changed, and not mostly for the better. The city was in decline, and in a broad sense, so were its schools. Remember 1968 was the time of Ocean Hill, Brownsville. And while New York did not have the terrible riots of Los Angeles and Newark and Detroit. Nevertheless, there was discontent and destruction and violence in this city. White flight was in full throttle. Brooklyn and the Bronx, each by themselves, lost more than 300,000 people just in the 1970s. And by the way, that was more than Detroit lost. In fact, you could argue that New York City was on a path as extreme as Detroit. Mass transit ridership was down to below a billion per year. Crime was up. Corporation headquarters were moving their headquarters to the suburbs or to the south. New York's problems were not minor and not temporary. Just for example, as late as 1955, this was the leading industrial city in the world and had been for half a century. We didn't have blast furnaces. We didn't have automobile assembly lines. We didn't make airplanes like LA. Thousands of little stops sewing buttons onto jackets. Brewing beer. Beer's a good example. As late as 1960, more beer was brewed in New York than in St. Louis and Milwaukee together. 
if you're into beer, St. Louis and Milwaukee, they jump out at you. By 1980, no beer was brewed in New York. Rheingold and others had left. Essentially, one million industrial jobs simply disappeared in New York between the 1950s and 2000. The story of the harbor is not so different. From about 1860 to 1960, it was the busiest port in the world. In fact, I call your attention to an exhibition on New York in World War II, which points out that in World War II, New York was the port of embarkation, not a port of embarkation, the port of embarkation. So if you were going to North Africa, Italy or to the England or France or Germany, you were likely, almost certainly, going to go through the Port of New York. The Port of New York was so busy in the late 19th century and on into the 20th that there were no income taxes. You know, now we've practically stopped the government because we can't agree. They had none because the costs of running the federal government were paid by import duties collected in the Port of New York and two-thirds of the foreign trade of the United States passed through the Port of New York. Economically, that meant there were hundreds of thousands of jobs. Stevedores who shaped up twice a day to get a job loading and unloading bags and boxes. Some of you may be old enough to remember one of the great movies in American history, On the Waterfront, with Marlon Brando and Carl Malden and Eva Marie Saint about the docks in 1954 and what a tough, violent place they were. That was just before the change. The change was mainly containerization. Somebody invented from New Jersey and North Carolina a big box, the back end of a truck, load things into there. Now it's no longer bags and boxes. Now it takes one guy to put a hook into this container. It's stacked onto ships. Another guy in the crane, they move it over, they lower it in Port Newark or put it on the back of a truck. Done. Three guys are doing in a few hours what hundreds took a few days to do. So which, and by the way, the rise of the Pacific Rim didn't help either, so now the largest port in the United States is Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. In fact, there's so few jobs <clears throat> connected to the harbor today that the Head of the Port Authority told me just a few years ago that it really doesn't matter because there's so few jobs attached to this international trade. A truck driver drives in, puts the thing on the bank, drives out. Next thing you know, he's at a Walmart distribution center and is north of Dallas or wherever he's going. The larger point I want to make, though, is that New York rose again. We lost the pillars of our economy, and yet the city came back. The quickest way to see this is in advertisements, real estate. In the 1950s, New York newspapers, escape. Escape from cities too dirty, too crowded, too dangerous to call home. As it had been for really decades, the idea was, and for the schools as well, to educate people so they can get out. Now, I tend to exaggerate. Moving to the suburb is the suburbs is the loser's option. <laughs> you can see that just by glancing at the real estate section on any weekend. Look at the numbers. If it's under a million dollars and it's talking about multiple bedrooms, it's not in the city. Um, anyway, I won't, I won't belabor the point. You know what I'm talking about. Um, the public schools did not rise in perception as fast as the city. In other words, the city has changed. The city is now attracting young, creative people. But the perception, at least, is that the quality of life in the city has improved, but not so much the schools. The challenges, of course, are not only for New York, but also for our entire nation. And we there more than the schools, terrorism, Deficits, deadlocks in Washington, trying to extricate ourselves from the longest war in our history, poverty that won't seem to go away, unemployment that may be 
systemic that we really can never see an unemployment rate, some say is lower as 4% again, that there are structural changes. And along with these changes, our schools are once again in focus. Many people, as you know, see teachers as part of the problem instead of part of the solution. It would be easy to despair, but let's don't do that. Rather than see the glass as half empty, let's see it as half full. Rather than see problems, let us see challenges. Indeed, is the situation today so different from what it was 125 years ago? Just think of immigrants. When we think of New York in this founding era, at the turn of the century, our image is of immigrants pouring into the city. Indeed, they were. But let me tell you this. There are many more immigrants in the city today than there ever were in the beginning of the century. And they're from many more places. Now there are three million legal people born in another country. Not Italian-Americans, but born in another country. They were counted by the census taker. We all know that they undercounted. The undocumented were under the bed and told their sister, not here. We think there may be as a million, a million of those. So there may be three or four million immigrants in the city today and probably about as many in the suburbs. We should thank, I think, our tradition of toleration. Unlike Alabama or Arizona, New York is a haven, the city and the state. And the governor and the mayor have both made it clear that New York is not cooperating that New York will celebrate its own immigrant past, that they're the ones who built this city and made it this great city. Also, there's general agreement now that education and schools are paramount for the American future. The answer, however, may be the same now as it was 125 years ago. Professional teachers need reliable knowledge about the conditions under which children learn most effectively. The challenge is as important now as it was then. And as we confront the spirit and legacy of Teachers College, which I think are essential to solving the problem that seems to be eluding us, we might remember that 25 years ago, people thought crime was impossible to control. It just was going to go up and up and up and up. Now, I spoke to the federal judges in New York a couple of years ago, and I said, only partly in jest, I almost feel sorry for the criminals. If you commit a crime now, you better, and you do it outside, you need to smile, because you're going to be on the evening news. And by the way, they can trace us, tra trace us every, from our cell phones to our credit cards to our easy pass to our metro cards to everything. Or as I, on this very stage, I asked President Clinton, so when you became president, crime seemed out of control. Now in New York, nobody thinks about that anymore. But education, the public schools were perceived as poor when you became president, and they still are. As we look toward the next quarter century, we do have a huge advantage. The city beckons. It represents our future, not our past. So we celebrate tonight the founders of Teachers College, the dedicated professionals who have taught there, the thousands of graduates who have been effective and if memorable teachers for our children, and as we move into the heart of the 21st century, looking forward with confidence to the challenges in the schools before us, and they'll be solved in New York probably before anywhere else, we're confident that Teachers College will honor the mission and the call. As was said of Grace Dodge, education is the means to better homes, better children, better communities, better morals in a word, a better world.
Thank you very much.